My name is Oliver Guinan. I'm here to uh, talk a little bit about uh, satellite imagery and some of the work that uh, we're doing with OpenStreetMap. Um, so first, I want to take a, a little bit of time to explain who Skybox is and uh, uh, what we're doing. We haven't really had a big public presence so far. Um, so Skybox is building satellites to take pictures of the world, uh, similar to the satellite view that you see in Google Maps, Bing Maps, uh, and even in parts of uh, uh, the Mapbox data set. So we want to mine these, these maps for information about the world to enable that vision that you see above to deliver unprecedented insight into da daily global activity. So we've been around for about four years. Um, building satellites is not easy, so it's taken us a little bit of time to get to this point. Uh, we're entirely backed by Silicon Valley Venture Capital, and uh, we've grown steadily over the last few years from four people, our, our four founders back in 2009, to uh, just about 100 people today. Um, right now, we're just a few months away from the launch of our first satellites. So it's a pretty exciting time for Skybox, and uh, we're excited to tell people about the data we've got and what it's going to look like. So every time I explain Skybox to people, they say, well, isn't this data already available today? You know, can't, you, can't you just buy this data from, from other people? So the answer is yes. You, you absolutely can get this data uh, if you're a government and if you've got billions of dollars to spend. So today, there are a, a really small number, uh, actually five, uh, commercial satellites available that take high-resolution Im imagery data. Uh, there's one company in the United States, which is Digital Globe, and one country in Europe, which is Astrium, uh, that provides this kind of data. Um, they fly these nice satellites. They're beautiful. They cost about $800 million to a $1 billion a piece to uh, go launch them. Um, but these really nice satellites, which produce the, the nice data we're used to seeing in uh, online mapping providers, they can only be in one place at one time, uh, no matter how expensive they are. So you can get one picture over New York. You can't get pictures over New York every few hours. They're really capacity constrained. The end result of that is that a lot of today's data in these online mapping portals in particular is pretty old. So it's not just weeks or months old, but you know, for example, this uh, data from Brazil, it's years old. It's from 2007. Um, so this is one of the most uh, deforested parts of the Amazon. Um, who knows what's happened between 2007 and today? Uh, but certainly, the guys that are out there, you know, free clearing this uh, this forest, are pretty certain that there isn't a, a satellite looking at them, and nobody else is monitoring this data to see what anybody is actually doing to it. So, OpenStreetMap users are, are really motivated to use things like high resolution Im high resolution imagery to monitor deforestation. Uh, the problem is that that imagery is just not available to them today. So, Skybox is solving this problem by building lower cost, highly capable satellites at a significantly lower price point uh, than the, the existing satellites. And that enables, enables us to build and launch more satellites for that same amount of money. And that means that we can be in more places more often. With a, constellate, with a single satellite, you can get to any one place on the Earth about once every three and a half days. With two satellites, you can cut that in half. With four satellites, you can cut that in half again. With about 24 satellites, you can get a morning, afternoon, and evening revisit anywhere on the Earth. So what's our data actually going to look like? Right here is an example of very simulated color imagery. It's our best estimate right now of our on-orbit performance based on sample flights, mathematical models of our MERS, lenses, cameras, and image enhancement software. So for us, the image is certainly good enough to see an airplane. It's certainly good enough to see that this airport is busy or not busy. Um, and one real measure of success that, that we've always kind of measured ourselves against is that parking lot over in the corner. Uh, if you can count cars in that parking lot, if you can identify cars, we think we've, we've done a good job. We've got useful data. So as well as, image, as, well as still image data, we're also going to be the first uh, commercial provider of high-resolution resolu high uh, video from space. Um, this uh, video right here was taken uh, from a Learjet, which is our test platform, uh, flying around Portland, Oregon. We did a scaled experiment, uh, basically took away all the light, took pictures at the rate that the satellite would actually take the pictures, uh, and then stitched that back together into uh, this nice HD quality video. Um, video is pretty awesome. You can see things in video that you would never see in a still image. Uh, you can see the reflection of the sun, for example. Uh, you know, reflecting off the cars uh, as, as, it's parked, as it moves down the street. Um, there's also a rail line over in the, 
sort of right corner of that image, uh, just south of the, or just below the, uh, the, the freeway overpass. And you'll see the sun reflect off that in a few moments. And it really lights the thing up. So you can start to identify features you would never see in, in a still image. Or there would actually be negatives in a still image to see a really blown out um, specular reflection in there. Um, you also get to see the cars. Um, you can see every lane of traffic. Uh, you can see whether lanes are moving or, or backed up. Um, you can also get to see right in the city blocks. You can see the cars moving within a single city block. Um, when I first saw this picture, I was like, wow, this is, this is Sim City uh, in real life. Uh, which is pretty cool, like you really get to see that, that level of detail. So data is interesting, uh, but information is actually useful. So uh, the big challenge is discovering what's the interesting information in the data uh, and presenting that in a way that, that people can actually approach and see and understand. So uh, this application was created working with our partners at Mapbox. Uh, some of you may have seen this featured on TechCrunch a couple of months ago. Uh, so we wanted to determine if um, High or if rapid revisit satellite images were actually going to be useful for people, if, if there was enough data in there that uh, it would make sense. Um, so we took these images over the, from an existing satellite provider. As it happens, th these are Iconos images. So uh, roughly, we want to hit the same sort of level of quality that Iconos produces with our own satellites. Um, so we took a bunch of images uh, between December 2012 and February 2013, uh, worked with Mapbox to register them together. And uh, this application is actually a map. You can pan, zoom around it. I think if you go to the Mapbox lab site, you can, you can use this application. Uh, you can zoom in, zoom out, move around the data. Um, you see all sorts of fascinating information in here. You see ships come and go. You see the, the cranes moving. Um, you see the, uh, containers, the, containers get, the container yards get full and empty. You see the shipping yards. There's actually a shipping yard a little bit north of this. Um, um, as the trains come in and out, you, you see the yards fill, the yards empty. Um, it's just jam-packed with interesting and useful, useful information. And because it's a map, you can also add additional layers annotated and, and do some other really interesting, information, inform, interesting things to it. So that's one end of the scale where you've got this really impressive map. It's a full application. You can do all sorts of interesting stuff with it. This one is exactly at the opposite end of the scale in terms of complexity. It's about as simple as you can possibly go. Uh, so we took two images about three weeks apart uh, over Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, register the, those images together, and then create an, a two-frame animated GIF, or GIF. Um, you really couldn't get a lot more, a lot more simple than that. Um, but now you can see the progress of uh, build-out of this residential area. Um, you can see houses get completed that were started in the first image. Uh, you can see new roofs go on houses that, are, that were in progress in the first image. And you can see new home starts. You can see the new foundations get laid uh, for, the, for those uh, new, as the new homes start, uh, start build-out. As it turns out, new home starts are one of the leading economic indicators. Um, so this is really interesting and fun data to start to play with. Um, when you see the color version of this image, you can even see when the lawns get laid and uh, when the houses are really ready to move into. So Skybox has also used OpenStreetMap data um, to create some really interesting applications that uh, help discover information in our images. Uh, we wanted to create a simple land use classification that we could use as a reference to check our own satellite images against. So if we know where the rivers or coastlines or forests are supposed to be, we can look for those same, same uh, types of features in our, in our own images. So Neil, up top here, one of our imaging engineers, uh, started off by downloading OpenStreetMap data. He imported it into, uh, I think he took the state of California as his starting point, imported it into uh, PostGIS, uh, created a, uh, a sample map, a sim really simplified map using MapNIC, um, where he classified a lot of the features into layers. Um, uh, it, it, he classified a lot of the complex features in, into feature types and then generated a PNG uh, image out of that. So he did a lot of work to turn things into urban area, uh, forest, uh, agricultural, and so on. Um, so I, I think he ended up with about 18 different classes of data and then a very small amount of unclassed data at the end. So. Um, once we took that PNG and we looked at where, what types of features were in that area, we could register that against uh, some of our sample images that we created and then see how well they matched up. So it got really interesting if there was water in the OpenStreetMap uh, classification map, but no water in the, uh, in the image that we produced. Something was wrong. Either something had gone wrong in one of our algorithms or there was something wrong in the OpenStreetMap data lying underneath. Um, but either way, it was probably worth somebody going out and taking a look at that and making sure that um, the data source was actually correct. Um, of course, this kind of thing can also easily capture stuff like seasonality. So 
um, you know, if you look at a, a, a river, lake, or a reservoir, it's not going to have the same borders, winter, spring, fall. Um, but in, in OpenStreetMap, that border is a, it's a hard border. It's just a, a, a straight vector line. Um, so by matching it up with um, satellite imagery, you can do much more interesting work to start tracing uh, where at different times of year those, bo those borders really lie. You could also use it to uh, solve that problem of uh, forests where there, no forests where there used to be forests in Brazil, for example. And that becomes really interesting. So the previous project was an interesting proof of concept, uh, but we want to enable that kind of uh, analytics at a global scale. Um, so in reality, we took Zoom Layer 10 and we created a, a classification map at Zoom Layer 10 for all of California. That was kind of interesting. Very quickly, we were like, okay, now we want a lot more detail uh, in, in those Zoom layers. So, um, and that's representative of a whole class of problem that we want to take on. So uh, we created a platform based around Apache Hadoop uh, to ingest, store, and process geospatial data. So bringing the software to the data is really the only way to process data on the scale that, that we're talking about. Um, our satellites produce about a terabyte of data per day, and of course we want to launch a lot of them. Uh, and every time we build a derived product, that also adds more data. So very quickly you get to an amount of data that's just unusable if you're bringing the data to software to, to, uh, to analyze it. So once you bring the software to the data, then you can, you can write applications that create models of the world, uh, which then can be used to create useful applications and services. So uh, you know, a great example of this is in, in LinkedIn, for example, they've got all of the social graph data. Uh, but they uh, create a map of people you may know, for example, um, and that's an application that lives outside of the uh, outside of their outside of their Hadoop platform, lives in the application space. So, we believe that there are lots and lots of applications like this that we can build based on geospatial data. So, standard Hadoop is uh, open source software. It uh, basically allows you to treat a set of computers as uh, a single computer with a bunch of CPUs and an enormous an enormous disk. Uh, in, per in, in theory, it's general purpose, um, but mostly today it's used for analyzing log data, creating models based on that data, tracking ads and uh, who's clicking on ads and making more interesting and useful ad models. Uh, we extended it with a platform that, uh, or with, it, with a framework that we call Busboy, um, and that's an interface between C or other languages and the, uh, the Hadoop environment. So from the Hadoop point of view, um, Busboy is managing the data uh, that a particular job is working on. Um, Busboy reads that data in and hands it over to the native code to go process that data. This is, for us, that, that one was pretty interesting because a lot of our imaging engineers, uh, they work in C. There's a huge body of work in computer vision and geospatial data processing written in C and C++. So we wanted to enable that in the Hadoop environment. And Busboy was really the, the mechanism that, that uh, got us there. Um, we also built a bunch of interfaces from the Hadoop world uh, to allow logging, uh, progress tracking, um, Inputs and outputs, of course, uh, data going in and out of the program back into, into the system. So with the platform that we put together, uh, we have all of, the geos all of our geospatial data, all of the analytic capability of Hadoop, including HBase, Hive, uh, Mahout, all of the uh, machine learning capabilities that are inherently built into Hadoop, and all the scalability that you get from Hadoop mashed together with the many, many years of uh, data processing uh, that, that uh, people have built up knowledge about that data that people have built up over the years uh, in geospatial data and image uh, and computer, computer vision. So we want to enable this ecosystem of applications based on regularly updated image data, just like GPS spawn an ecosystem uh, of applications based on regularly updated location data. Uh, yeah, we want to do it based on image data uh, and GPS data based on location data. Um, we build these satellites kind of, kind of fast. We turn them around pretty quickly. This was September 2012. On the left side, you see SkySat 1. Um, on the right side, you see the, the bare bones of uh, SkySat 2. And behind it, the engineer, uh, Paul, who's putting together SkySat 2. That was back in September. Um, this was just a couple of weeks ago. We've got both satellites built up, sitting in our clean room, uh, and ready for launch. So to get to the, point, to get to the, the, the big vision that we've got of building this, uh, this, data, this data platform partners, uh, such as Mapbox and the applications that they built and developers are really critical. Um, we, want to build, we want to bring the image and video data with two satellites coming later this year to the community of people who just want data. So combining this data with, with OpenStreetMap, which is really the richest uh, open data set, geographic data set in the world, uh, we think is a huge opportunity for data producers, data consumers, and ultimately the end users. 
Um, I think the, the, the work that OpenStreetMap did in Haiti, um, you can imagine how much easier that work would have been if you had video, if you had rapid revisit. Um, more recently in Oklahoma, anywhere the changes happen very, very quickly, uh, where, where some of these major disasters occur, we want to be there providing the data, making that data available for the OpenStreetMap community. So with that, I will take some questions. Um, I mentioned that we've got our launches coming up in the fall of this year. If you follow us at, at Skybox Imaging, um, we're regularly uh, sending out some updates, and we'll be constantly updating that as we get towards launch. So thank you very much. Yeah, so yeah, the question was, are we using Hadoop more as a, a workflow manager or are we actually using it for MapReduce? Um, we, we're using it for both. Um, so MapReduce really is the backbone of all of our, all of our data processing. Uh, we've got a workflow um, which takes our raw satellite data and turns it into level 1B data. It's got about six steps in it, some of which are com reasonably complex, some of which are I.O. band, some of which are CPU band. Uh, and we use MapReduce for all of those steps. Uh, so if I jump back, if I can jump back here a little bit. Um, so the, basically our image processing team focuses on that green area, the C code. So they build standalone algorithms um, that we then bring into the Hadoop environment and they become MapReduce jobs once we wrap them in that busboy interface. Um, so Hadoop is managing where the data is and, and how it's working. Yeah, so um, I'll answer the sec second question first. So uh, the question is, one, are we going to open source it? And two, are we using streaming or JNI or whatnot to, to make this work? Um, we're using JNI. Uh, we tried streaming. Uh, it did not work well. Yeah, so. I, I tried streaming and it worked okay. It just never did Yeah, the, the issue with streaming is it's very hard to keep the data locality that you, that you really want to you, you manage. manage. Right, right. Oh, oh, the open... Damn, I was trying to get away from that question. Um, so, we do, so we use a lot of open source software uh, and we want to be active open so members of the open source community. It's one of our, uh, our company goals. Um, so we don't know is the, is the real answer. We don't know what we're going to do with the, with the Busboy API. Um, we're pretty pleased with the way it's developing at the moment. Um, we know it could move a lot faster if we did open source it. Um, it's definitely something we talk about pretty regularly, uh, but we don't have a firm decision on it yet. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're we're pretty excited about it. We think it's a pretty powerful tool, um, and not just for our own, our own use, but we've we've worked with a couple of partners to bring their algorithms into this environment, and it's worked really pretty well. Uh, Um, we're primarily raster based, but there's no, there's no particular tie. I mean, we, we work with really primitive data types at this level, so it, it's just bytes. So um, the question was that basically, uh, do you anticipate there are going to be problems with governments and so on who don't want you to image where, where you're imaging? Um, so spaces, spaces is open, open for, for business purposes. Um, since the mid-90s, the US uh, has uh, allowed commercial operators to take pictures from space. Um, we're licensed by NOAA, uh, by the US government, to operate these satellites and take these pictures. Um, there are a certain, there are a couple of restrictions on that, um, but for general purposes, really it's pretty open. You can take pictures of, of pretty much anywhere. Um, there's a couple of things we have to do. For example, we have to make pic pictures available to a country if we take pictures of that country at the same price we would charge anybody else. We're a commercial operator. We're happy to sell those pictures to whoever wants them. Uh, there are several countries that are embargoed. Obviously, we're not allowed to do business with them. 
um, but that they would be the same countries that you would be used to seeing on any embargo list. So um, that doesn't stop us from taking pictures of those countries. It just stops us from selling those pictures to those countries. Yeah, so uh, that, that question was what spectral bands are you using? Um, so we've got uh, panchromatic, obviously. Uh, you saw that from the video. Uh, we've got red, green, blue, and near infrared. If there's a market demand for this in the future, we can, we can do lots of interesting things with future generations of the satellite. Um, I think, uh, if I jump back here a little ways, um, our satellite lifetime is a little shorter than typical, uh, th than the seven and a half years that uh, I believe this is GOI one right here. Um, we're looking at about four years. So, you know, think about that as the technology uh, life cycle. Um, we're launching, you know, we, we plan on launching part of a refresh of the constellation every year, every year to 18 months. Um, so if you work back from that, we can turn around new technology reasonably quickly with these satellites. Um, our satellite, uh, satellite systems uh, VP likes to say that we're bringing Moore's law to space. Because for space, this is a really fast turnaround. Are you going to participate in things like next year, like Yeah, I mean, yeah. The answer to that one is I don't know yet. Uh, we we haven't engaged with with uh, with those guys yet, but. Um, Certainly, humanitarian relief is one of the primary uses that we, we think that we're going to put the satellite to. Um, you know, one of the most frustrating things right now is that we don't have the satellite up there. So every time something happens, we're like, damn it, if we had you know, you know, video from Oklahoma or video from Japan, you know, we think that the, the disaster response would, would be materially different. Um, so yeah, it would be nice to have, the, have it up there and have that data available more quickly. Yeah, so um, we, we have two launches. Uh, one is launching from uh, Baikonur on a Soyuz, and uh, the other is launching from Yasny, which is a, um, a nuclear missile base in Russia. Um, so to decommission ICBMs, basically they put sat take the nukes off, put satellites on, and so we're launching on one of those guys. Hey. Um, so that's a big part of why we're here, because we think that, that people in this room here can answer that question way better than we can. Um, so whoever's best at counting the cars in, uh, in this parking lot right here, they're, they're going to figure out the best way to deliver that data to the end user. Um, so you know, we, we think about this in, as similar to the app exchange model that Salesforce has, where lots of people can come along and you know, build applications to do specific things, and they're going to get really, really good at doing those specific things. Um, so We've done some experiments where we've, we've, we've done some of, the, some of this kind of thing ourselves. Um, we can turn around, you know, depending on the kind of parking lot you're looking at, with rapid revisit, you can turn it around within a few hours. Um, but you can imagine doing this at the scale of the entire United States, where you're looking at every Walmart parking lot in the country or every Home Depot parking lot in the country. It's a lot of data to go analyze. And yeah, the process of managing that is going to be, you know, going to be quite, a, quite a challenge all on its own. Sure, sure. Um, and right. And how old how old is your data today? The image data? Um, I'm going to give a little bit of the same answer that we don't absolutely know the answer to that question yet. It's, it, again, it's a discussion we have uh, internally quite a bit. Um, there's a very good case for doing that because it allows people to build applications on this data. Um, and, you know, and if you're building applications on historic data, it increases the demand for new data. And 
that's, that's good business for us. Um, so we do talk about that quite a bit, and if we can put a good business case together around that, I think, I think it's very, you know, it, it's certainly possible that we would do it, um, but it, it's going to take a lot of work on the business side to see what kind of business model we can, we can put around that. Right, right. And I think that's one of the things with rapid revisit you can, you can do, right? If it's cheap, you know, if you can you know, cheaply get the data again and again uh, and you're not capacity constrained, then you can, do, you can do some of that kind of stuff. You can get the data at the ideal time. Um, you can, and the, the other really interesting challenge we've got, which I haven't really talked about a lot today, is working around clouds. Uh, if we, you know, taking a cloudy picture is just a, a terrible waste of the resource. Uh, if we can avoid taking pictures of the clouds and if we can get smart about that, then uh, again, that, in, that effectively increases our capacity, uh, and we can take more interesting pictures. We did get some nice pictures of Portland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We 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 picked our days on that one. We we ended up sitting on the ground in Portland for a long time to get uh, to get to, to get those nice uh, nice pictures. The uh, yeah yeah. You can tell it's a nice sunny day. We got some nice nice pictures down there. Oh, I should have mentioned a little bit earlier that we've got a booth downstairs as well, uh, where we've got a 3D version of this. It's, it's basically a stereo video. Uh, version of this guy, uh, as well as some other sample data. So if you haven't stopped by downstairs, feel, feel free to do that. Yep. Um, so the question was, are we going to have streaming video as a product, and are we going to use pred Predator formats or, or whatever, whatever formats the, the, uh, the Predator uses? Um, the video stuff, um, it, it's pretty interesting to us. It, it's a pretty cool application. There's no, there, nobody in the world uses video from commercial satellites because it, it's just not available today. Um, so we're going to have to start building up some good use cases for it. Um, the stream, uh, streaming video, so yeah, I should explain that we're in a polar orbit. So we can task our satellite once every 90 minutes. It'll go around the Earth and take the pictures we told it to. It'll downlink at the end of that 90 minutes. It'll take us a little while to process that data. So, you know, this data, it's, it's going to be several hours from the time you said get this picture, and the satellite was capable of getting that picture to when that picture comes out the other end. Um, so, this isn't real time, it's not close to real time, but it is very predictable time. Um, the, uh, the video formats, this, one, this one's an MP4 with a little bit of metadata in it. Um, it wouldn't be a big deal to match up the right metadata. We've got, a, you know, we have a lot of data from the satellite about where the camera was, where the sun was at the moment the picture was taken, so it really wouldn't be a big deal to customize that format to do to, to whatever we needed. Yep. Um, so yeah, the question was that are we taking oblique photos or, or just overhead? So um, we can point our satellite. Um, so we, we basically, the, an image or a, a video like this, we're tilting back uh, negative 30 degrees from the target holding on the target and then um, going 30 degrees forward from the target. Um, so that, that's, the, that, that's the mechanism we're using. So it, it's, it's a little different than an aerial oblique image uh, where you're using the pixels at the edge of the sensor to, to get the biggest angle you can. We have a lot of control over the angle that we're using. So um, again, if you look at the stereo video we've got downstairs, you, it's about 30 seconds long or 35 seconds long. You actually get to see three sides of a building uh, over that 35 seconds. You start off on one side, come over the top and down the other side. Then if you match that up with rapid revisit, you can pick up the other, you, you can, you know, stitch in the rest of that. So you can start to build really interesting 3D data from that. Um, we're based in uh, Tromso, Norway, and uh, Fairbanks, Alaska. About as far north as you can go and stay on fiber and avoid, and avoid polar bears. That's Ah, so um, actually satellite imagery is used, of course, very heavily in agriculture today. Um, there's a, a well-used algorithm, uh, NVDI, uh, to monitor the, the health of vegetation. Um, and that, that's, that's a, a strong use case today. Um, people want more images. They want them more often. Um, you know, they'd like to get, instead of one shot during, the, during a growing season, they'd like to get several. Um, so you can use that to monitor crop health. You can use it to manage your irrigation, uh, see the result of fertilization, that kind of stuff. 
Was that does that answer the question? Uh, let me let me jump back to that slide so I can actually see what it said. Ah, detecting. Oh, no, oh so uh, in your, both in Europe and the United States, um, there is a model where uh, the government basically pays you to leave the field empty uh, for a period of time. Um, the way you do that is you, you go plow the field or you basically leave it unplanted. Um, if it turns out that someone's planting corn or whatnot in that field, then that is unauthorized activity. Um, so again, these programs are monitored very heavily by satellite images today, and this is, this, this is an extension of that. That was a good question. No more? Okay. Okay, that's my time. Thank you very much for, for listening. I appreciate it. <laughs>